So how much of aging is genetic and how much environmental? Uh, according to estimates, actually, uh, only 25% of uh, uh, aging is genetic and uh, 75% is due to the environment. So lifestyle, but also exposure to toxicants and uh, um, emotional stress and all these factor, so uh, genetic and environmental factor, um, uh, can uh, uh, lead with time to an impaired um, uh, ability of our body to remove damage and uh, uh, bring our system back to homeostasis. Um, so a decreased adaptive capacity of the body, which leads to aging. And uh, uh, perhaps it's not surprising that uh, genes play such a small role in aging. After all, we know that uh, eusocial animals with the same genome can have drastically different lifespans. Uh, for example, we know um, that um, in uh, uh, honeybees, uh, we have the worker bees uh, who are short-lived. Uh, they are much smaller than the queens, uh, which are, uh, in contrast, long-lived. They can live 20 times longer than worker bees, and they are fertile. And what is surprising is that worker and queen bees have the same genome, the same genes. The only difference between uh, queens and uh, worker bee bees uh, is an epigenetic difference. And this epigenetic difference is triggered very early in the development of a queen uh, larva. So queen larvae are fed with royal jelly, which is a protein-rich substance secreted by the worker bees. And uh, therefore diet, diet is responsible for, for this remarkably um, uh, strong phenotypic difference between uh, uh, worker bees and queen bees uh, by triggering an, an epigenetic program that turns on genes responsible to produce the, the queen phenotype, to make the queen a queen. And so, therefore, epigenetics is, uh, I think, the queen of the omics sciences in showing uh, the power of food, in uh, demonstrating that food is not only calories, but it's also information. Nutrients in the food we eat are one of the most powerful signals to our genes, specifically, uh, the nutrients in the food we eat send signals to uh, so-called writer or eraser enzymes on, uh, um, on our genes. So these are enzymes that either write or erase molecular marks on the top of our genes that can turn genes on and off. And these molecular marks are called epigenetic marks. Epi means on the top in the Greek language. And so epigenetics means on the top of the DNA. And on the top of the DNA, there are these switches that can turn genes on and off. And this process of turning genes on and off can explain why, for example, we have the same DNA in every single cell of our body, and yet the different cells of our body look different from each other. Liver cells, brain cells. The reason is that despite having the same genes, the same hardware, they all have a different epigenome, a different software that turns on different genes in different cells. 
And uh, this, so the magic of epigenetics can not only explain why we have different cells in our body, but also in general why uh, organisms uh, and cells with the same genome can have different phenotypes. Uh, so um, identical twins, the caterpillar and the butterfly, uh, worker bees and queen bees, eye cells uh, expressing different color pigments and the calico cats with, uh, with different pigments in, in their fur. Um, uh, in, uh, yes, that gives different color to their fur. So for this reason, you, you can think of uh, your genome as uh, hardware and your epigenome as software. And to understand this uh, remarkable software, uh, we, uh, we need to discuss two important property of uh, um, the epigenome. The first is epigenetic flexibility and the second is epigenetic memory. So unlike our genes, uh, the um, epigenome is uh, flexible, is dynamically remodeled by our environment and lifestyle. And this is throughout our life. So when, uh, when we first begin uh, our journey uh, in, uh, in life, um, uh, the, when the, the egg from, uh, from, uh, from mom and the, the, the sperm from, from uh, dad fuse together, they raise most of their epigenetic marks. I'm saying most of them, not all of them, but um, most, most epigenetic marks are erased. And this, give, uh, um, this gives rise to uh, embryonic stem cells. So stem cells are cells that can become any type of cell. Why? Because they don't have epigenetic marks to instruct them uh, about which genes to turn on and off. Only during fetal development when uh, uh, the epigenetic mark, uh, marks starts, start to be re-established in the cell, then um, the cell do differentiate in the different cell types in our organism. And uh, um, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, developmental window, so fetal development, is a, a sensitivity window for our epigenome, where um, we are uh, particularly uh, sensitive to env environmental factors that can uh, either uh, improve our epigenetic function or produce adverse effect. And that's why also um, this is why, a reason why there is a, um, a focus also in clinical practice in supporting uh, nutrition, especially before and during pregnancy. The other property of the epigenome is uh, epigenetic memory. Um, uh, so the epigenome, we have seen that the epigenome is flexible, uh, is, it changes in response, in response to environmental stimuli, but it is also stable. So it is, uh, um, uh, uh, it is stable through cell division. The epigenetic marks are passed from, from uh, uh, the, the, the mother cell to the daughter cell. And this is important for epigenetic memory. So the epigenome is able to store a memory of our environmental exposure because of its flexibility and is its stability through cell division. And, uh, and uh, so epigenetic memory can have a profound effect on health and disease. And in particular, we know that uh, the, the epigenetic notes that are written on our genes before our birth tend to be written with a pen, tend to be permanent. 
whereas the notes that are written after our birth tend to be written with a pencil, so potentially reversible. And both pen and pencil mark can contribute to our health and uh, risk to develop disease. Um, it's also a good thing that some uh, marks are written with a pen. If you think about that, uh, these, uh, uh, the, mark, the marks that are written in pen are responsible for cell identity. So they make sure that, for example, the cell of uh, your skin uh, remain uh, skin cells and don't turn into an eye cell or uh, another type of cell. And that's also why the marks that are written before our birth tend to be um, permanent. But this also means that, uh, as I mentioned before, the exposures uh, early in life uh, can have a, a long lasting effect. And this can be a good thing or a, a bad thing uh, in uh, some cases. So how can we use diet to improve our epigenetic function? Epinutrients are our royal jelly. They nourish our epigenome and unlock our full potential. These epinutrients can affect our epigenome in uh, two major ways. So uh, you can see here uh, again the writer enzymes and eraser enzymes that can write or erase uh, uh, chemical groups, epigenetic groups on our genes. These chemical groups can be methyl groups, uh, you have heard about that, but also acetyl groups. And so you have methylases and acetylases are example or writer enzymes and demethylases and deacetylases are uh, example of eraser enzymes. And uh, um, we, um, uh, so the uh, epinutrients can, can either donate methyl groups building blocks to build the epigenome uh, and these are called methyl donating nutrients an example um, uh, of these nutrients are folate choline uh, betaine uh, or they can actually modulate the activity of uh, writer and eraser enzymes and these are known as epibioactive nutrients, for example, sulforaphane. But some of these uh, um, uh, modulators are also metabolic cofactors, mitochondrial cofactors, uh, such as NAD+, uh, alpha-ketoglutarate. And uh, among the methyl donors, uh, we have not only um, folate and uh, um, other uh, B vitamins, uh, choline, but also some uh, bacteria um, uh, are, uh, uh, can produce methyl donors, for, for example, folate. Um, uh, and this is just an example. We know that Lactobacillus plantarum 299V uh, can produce folate in, uh, in uh, uh, presence of uh, para, uh, amino benzoic acid. I'm making this example now because we will see later there's a, that a recent study that um, used Lactobacillus plantarum in a, a lifestyle intervention could uh, demonstrate um, uh, an epigenetic rejuvenation after only eight weeks, which is interesting. Um, so this is a list uh, and just a short, very short list of, uh, of uh, epinutrients um, uh, in, in, in the food we eat and other metabolic cofactors. These are ph phytochemicals, vitamin, uh, vitamins and minerals, uh, um, uh, probiotics, postbiotics uh, and uh, um, other metabolites. So this is the, the reason, so epigenetics explains why it is important to have a whole food diet. Um, uh, epinutrients are 
everywhere in whole foods of, of plant origin and an animal origin uh, green leafy vegetables broccoli beans and lentils fish meats egg yolks nuts and seeds uh, milk and yogurt so now we will uh, dive a little deeper in the basics of epigenetic regulation of gene expression which um, are essential to understand how these switches work and how we may be able to use them in clinical practice to actually measure um, outcomes of uh, anti-aging interventions. So if you, uh, if you think about uh, a cell and, uh, and, uh, and the DNA, the DNA is contained in the, in the nucleus of the cell and uh, uh, which is uh, about three microns. So one micron is about 1% of the width of one air. So, and the DNA is uh, uh, six feet or two meters long. So putting the DNA inside the nucleus is like putting a 12.5 miles rope 20 kilometers long uh, in, a, in a ping pong ball, which is uh, 1.5 inches or 40 milli millimeter. Um, and that's a problem. That's, that's a big problem, which is solved by, um, uh, the, by histones, by the chromatin. So the chromatin is the name of the DNA and the, the histone proteins. Histones are proteins that um, uh, help coil uh, the DNA and make it compact so that it can fit inside the nucleus. So histones are positively charged and the uh, uh, DNA is negatively charged. And, uh, and so histone plus DNA equals chromatin and chromatin is the solution um, to, uh, to the problem of fitting the DNA inside the nucleus at the same time making it accessible so to that we can activate open the chromatin and close it and activate turn on and off genes as needed um, and so um, uh, epigenetic modification modulate uh, this very process of opening and closing the chromatin so um, active chromatin states are open states so when the chromatin is open a gene is on and when the chromatin is closed it's impossible for the for the cell machinery to read the genes so the gene is off and uh, this is also known as euchromatin and heterochromatin um, uh, uh, which uh, euchromatin corresponds to the region of the um, of the DNA which are open so they look white under the uh, a microscope um, uh, uh, and uh, heterochromatin uh, looks black when you when you stay in a cell with a, with a specific dye that binds the DNA and the reason for that is that the heterochromatin is more compact so the chromatin is closed and it looks black and so as we age we uh, we see um, uh, the, the deregulation of chromatin function on one side we see loss of heterochromatin so genes that should be silent become active and the, on the other side we also see we could say a loss of euchromatin or uh, so-called new senescent associated chromatin loci which means that genes that should be active become silent and um, the main uh, uh, epigenetic modification that uh, are implicated in our physiology and uh, and uh, get uh, deregulated with aging um, uh, are uh, DNA methylation uh, histone modifications and non-coding uh, uh, RNAs. Um, I've worked uh, during my careers on uh, each of these uh, epigenetic marks, um, 
uh, non-coding RNAs during my PhD, uh, histone modifications uh, during my postdoc, and now DNA methylations in humans. So they are all, uh, 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 these three modifications are all dear to my heart. Um, I will briefly describe um, each of these. Uh, histone modifications um, uh, are um, uh, different chemical groups attached directly to the histone proteins. And these are methyl groups, but also acetyl groups, uh, phosphoryl groups, uh, ubiquitin. So you may associate the concept of epigenetics with methylation, but epigenetics is much more than that. It's not only methylation. There are lots of different modifications that can impact our health and disease. The reason why you are more familiar with the methylation is also that we know um, we have tools to measure uh, methylation very precisely. And uh, particularly, we can measure very well DNA methylation, which is the methylation of cytosines in our DNA, uh, and uh, not any cytosine, but cytosines that are located within, within the uh, CG dinucleotide, which are called CPG sites, where the P stands for a phosphoryl group because this is always between nucleotides. So you will often hear CPG sites, and these are basically sites in your DNA that are methylated, so sites of DNA methylation. And so with aging, we have uh, changes in, uh, in uh, chromatin in both DNA methylation and histone modifications, not only methylation, but many other marks. Uh, and these changes overall um, uh, uh, are, so are different in heterochromatin and euchromatin, and overall they lead to uh, a deregulation of key genes, um, a deregulation of silent, um, uh, uh, silent um, uh, sequences in, in your DNA, which are, are called transposons, um, a lack of DNA repair, and an increased transcriptional noise. And we also have some uh, um, inherited diseases that affect chromatin structure and function and can lead to premature aging. For example, we know that um, the genes involved in uh, hutchinson guilford progeria syndrome and Werner syndrome, which is also known as adult progeria, are um, producing proteins that play an important role in chromatin structure and, or function. And you can see here a picture of a, a, Werner, uh, a Werner syndrome um, patient uh, at ages 15 on the left and uh, 48 on the right. And uh, uh, the uh, Werner protein uh, plays an important role in, it, in uh, chromatin and uh, its um, levels decline with aging. Um, and uh, this decline is also associated with the uh, loss of heterochromatin. And now let's, uh, we are finally at uh, what I think the most exciting uh, piece of information for, uh, for uh, us interested in the clinical applications of epigenetics. Epigenetics can be used in the clinic as we have seen to design lifestyle intervention that um, target uh, epi nutrients and uh, uh, pathways of epigenetics, but it's also becoming more and more relevant uh, as a, um, a potential biomarker for uh, longevity interventions. Um, uh, uh, specifically, epigenetic clocks uh, have been developed that can uh, be used for, uh, um, as uh, clinical endpoints for uh, human longevity trials, uh, also to better understand the basic uh, biology uh, of age-related epigenetics uh, and uh, how 
um, these processes uh, are linked to health outcomes and to for risk stratification to understand which patients may benefit more um, from which longevity interventions. So we have seen uh, that uh, the hallmarks of aging underlie um, uh, the biology of aging. And now we know that um, scientists uh, are developing uh, so-called aging clocks which can capture these, uh, some of these hallmark to provide a readout of your biological age. There are different clocks, um, so uh, molecular clocks such as the epigenetic clock um, are cutting edge clocks that are mostly used now only in research, or clinical research or uh, uh, university uh, research, uh, although some of them uh, are also available uh, for uh, um, uh, made available um, by direct to consumer uh, companies uh, and uh, are already uh, um, used in some uh, longevity clinics. Um, but we also have uh, low hanging fruit uh, like digital um, uh, clocks, for example, um, uh, based on uh, um, face uh, recognition that can estimate your age uh, uh, just based on, uh, on uh, photographs of pictures of uh, photo age, uh, they are called, or uh, physiological uh, uh, clocks, um, uh, blood-based clocks, uh, which not surprisingly for, uh, um, for many of you are based on clinical biomarkers that uh, had been always used in, uh, in medicine and functional medicine, uh, um, such as simple blood uh, panels, lipids, uh, but also C uh, reactive protein. And so these, uh, these, these clocks um, hold promise as, uh, as uh, uh, biomarkers for longevity uh, interventions. Um, and we will focus now on uh, epigenetic clocks, uh, uh, which are, uh, which are um, uh, the, the most precise way to estimate uh, chronological age uh, and, uh, um, and can provide um, a tool for estimating different outcomes related to biological age. So we have uh, around 28 million CPGs across the genome. One third of them show DNA methylation changes with age, so up or down. 60% uh, of these changes are due to uh, environmental factors and 40% of them to genetic factors. And epigenetic clocks, uh, there are different clocks, capture DNA methylation at a subset of these SNPs. Uh, different clocks uh, 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 capture, measure different CPGs, um, and uh, uh, in each clock, um, uh, the CPGs are selected through supervised machine learning trained against chronological age, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, epigenetic age acceleration is uh, defined as the difference between the uh, epigenetically measured age and the actual chronological age. And it's used as a biomarker of biological age. So for this reason, every uh, DNA methylation clock or epigenetic clock actually contains both chronological age information and biological age information. And different clocks have different precision for the chronological part and biological part. So there has been almost a race between different clocks in competing with each other, which is the one that is better at estimating chronological age. But if you think about that, we already have passports to estimate our chronological age. We don't really need such precise tool in the clinic, if not perhaps for forensic age calculation. So 
the, 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 um, whereas the biological uh, age, the measurement of biological age, the deviation between the actual chronological age is, is what uh, for us um, it might matter most for health. What, what is more, I think it's more important um, in terms of anti-aging medicine. And uh, there have been uh, uh, 11 epigenetic clocks developed since 2011. Here, here, uh, here you can see a snapshot of these clocks. As you can see, different clocks use uh, different CPGs and uh, have different correlations with the chronological age. And a recent um, paper published in 2020 and uh, cited here um, compared uh, the, the, the power of these uh, clocks in uh, uh, estimating different outcomes of biological age. And uh, what the, uh, the researcher, uh, researchers uh, found is that, um, yes, the, uh, the best clock in, in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, predicting chronological age is the um, uh, clock developed by Steve Horvath in 2013. Um, uh, but for biological age, uh, different clocks had a, bet a better performance in estimating different outcomes related to biological age. Biological age is a, a broad concept that uh, encompasses many mechanisms of aging. And so you can see that some clocks were better at predicting cancer outcomes, um, other clocks better at predicting cell senescence or mitochondria uh, dysfunction. And this is important because I, I teach a class on, uh, on uh, um, uh, longevity medicine and epigenetics and many students ask me, What's, what is the best clock? We don't know yet. We know that uh, depending on the outcome, there might be a better clock. And now we know actually that epigenetic clocks are composite measures of different age-related epigenetic changes or signals. Different clocks capture different epigenetic aging signals and associate with different health, health outcomes. And only some signals correlate with the mortality and are responsive to intervention. And these may the signals that matter most for health. So I, um, I believe uh, that uh, many new clocks will be developed by deconstructing the clocks that we currently have and isolating the components, the CPGs that are responsible for different signals and will focus on the signals that matter most for that type of uh, interventions and, uh, and patients. And we already have uh, an example of uh, this uh, half effort. So the, the group of uh, Morgan Levine uh, published in 2020 a meta clock, uh, which uh, was built um, by first deconstructing the, the known clocks, then isolating the signals that were most, uh, most relevant for different outcomes, and then putting those signals together um, uh, to find nov novel uh, associations for, uh, for health outcomes. For example, a novel association with Alzheimer's disease was, was found in, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this study. And so, uh, is this possible? Can we turn back the epigenetic clock? We can, we can do it already in the lab. Um, epigenetic age and uh, uh, other um, chromatin states can be rejuvenated in the lab uh, by uh, reprogramming differentiated cells to induce pluripotent stem cells or uh, iPSCs. Um, and we can do this uh, with the Yamanaka factors. Uh, the Nobel Prize in the 2012 for medicine was awarded for this discovery. Uh, but can we do this 
in the real world. There are now already a couple of trials in human, uh, humans showing that this is possible. Uh, there are, um, uh, this um, was demonstrated uh, with uh, uh, vitamin D. There was a, a rejuvenation of, of uh, almost two years um, uh, and uh, a cocktail of uh, growth hormone and uh, DHA and metformin was uh, producing a, a rejuvenation of 1.5 years in one year. Um, uh, a Mediterranean diet and plus vitamin D um, produced a rejuvenation of uh, epigenetic age of uh, 1.47 years um, and, uh, um, and uh, finally dietary and lifestyle intervention um, uh, uh, produced a rejuvenation of uh, epigenetic age of, in just eight weeks. And I would like to uh, provide more details about this last study. This uh, uh, was a study by Cara Fitzgerald. Uh, some of you may, may know Cara. She's a faculty as, uh, at the Functional Medicine Institute. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, she uh, and uh, Moshe Sif, which he, uh, is, uh, is uh, one a leading expert of uh, um, epigenetics and envi environmental epigenetics. Um, uh, this was a study in uh, 38 uh, males um, uh, age, aged 50 to 70 years, healthy, um, and uh, there was a control group and uh, an intervention group. Um, the intervention group um, uh, was assigned to a diet, a methylation diet, which was plant-centered but also rich in, a in animal proteins um, uh, rich in epinutrients such as egg uh, and liver um, and it was a multimodal intervention uh, which also involved uh, carbohydrate restriction, intermittent fasting, stress reduction and uh, there uh, also supplements were used. Um, I mentioned L plantarum uh, which is a bacterium that can produce folate uh, and uh, also a fruit and vegetable powder uh, rich in uh, methylation adaptogens um, uh, uh, by, uh, by Metagenics. And uh, um, this, uh, uh, the, uh, this lifestyle intervention produced a, a reversal of epigenetic age of two, three years and uh, an improvement of overall wellness markers such as blood lipids, glucose, and uh, uh, glycated hemoglobin. So the, the point here is that lifestyle and nutrition can produce a reversal of epigenetic age as quickly as in, in a few weeks. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, and this is, I think, what is inspiring. And I... I, if any of you is, uh, is uh, uh, planning to, to have a, um, a similar intervention in your clinics, please consider submitting your work uh, to this uh, special research topic that I'm curating with, uh, along with Morgan Levine um, and uh, Vittorio Sebastiano at Stanford University. So we just launched a special research topic, Aging Clocks in uh, Longevity Medicine. Um, and uh, um, yes, we welcome uh, uh, especially works from the clinic uh, and uh, with lifestyle interventions. And uh, with these, I would like to uh, 